couple weeks ago, my husband Joseph and I went on a camping trip. Who in here likes camping? Okay, great. We can be friends. I've actually only gone camping twice. This was my second time going camping, but I can tell you for sure I enjoy camping. Not like the super rugged, like dig a hole in the ground camping, but like amenities and things like that and and a blow-up mattress. But of course, we're going camping, so we have to do all the camping things. So we have a campfire, s'mores, hot dogs, all of that. But our family also loves games. So we brought tons of games to play. We only ended up playing a couple of games, but one of them was conversation cards. Has anyone played that game? I don't even know if it counts as a game, but basically it's these cards, and they just have questions on them. And like the name says, it's supposed to start conversations, conversation cards. So it just asks a question, and everyone has to answer the card. Some questions are serious. Some are like, what's your favorite animal and why? But one question that came up that actually gave me a lot of pause was, what makes you a good friend? And I was surprised by how long it took me to come up with an answer. And I want you to think, what would your answer be? What makes you a good friend? What does it mean to be a good friend? Am I a good friend? Should people want to be friends with me? Are you a good friend? What makes you a good friend? Now we're in the second week of a sermon series on relationships according to Proverbs. And Proverbs is a collection of wisdom brought together by the wisest king of Israel, King Solomon. And so looking through the wisdom of Proverbs, we're looking at the different ways that Proverbs tells us how to be wise in our relationships. So as I was researching through Proverbs this week, looking at how do you be a good friend, what does it mean to be a good friend, Proverbs reveals that a wise friendship is built on three things. You guys ready? Three things. You got it? You think you can remember three things? Okay, three things. Loyalty, truth, and forgiveness. Loyalty, truth, and forgiveness. If you brought your Bibles today, go ahead and open up to Proverbs chapter 17. Congratulations if you brought your Bible today. You guys get a coin in Kids Church. Um, You can go pick up your toy after service. (laughs) Proverbs chapter 17, verse 17. says, a friend is always loyal. Can you say always? A friend is always loyal. And a brother is born to help in a time of need. Now, some interpreters suggest that this passage should really say a brother is born of or from a time of need, of or from adversity. And this suggests that brotherhood is forged through hardship, through shared hardship. That is where friendship, where sisterhood, where brotherhood is forged, is created, is through those times of hardship. A couple years back, my husband Joseph and I, we served at the Dream Center in Los Angeles. If you're not familiar with the Dream Center, it's a nonprofit organization that does like a million things I couldn't even begin to tell you. But we were a part of their leadership school serving there, and we got to meet so many other students who were around the world. I have a friend in Germany, Texas, Mississippi, Alabama, like all the places. And so we forged some amazing friendships there. And it was because of the shared hard times that we went through. Granted, we we slept together, we ate together, we served together, we were together all day long. But the program set up different times for us to go through hardship together to form those bonds. One of those nights we called Love Hill. And well, it wasn't at night, but it was during the day. So we went to this park, and if you've ever been to like Elysian Park, it's got these like really massive hills. And the point of this day was literally to just form friendships. So what would happen is all the first-year students, Joseph and I were first years, we had to, the objective of every single person in our class has to get to the top of the hill, but you can't touch the ground. The person getting to the top can't touch the ground. You're like, what? So that means you literally had to climb on people's backs, and they had to carry you up this very, very steep hill. And for some people, that was really difficult, 
really difficult. I can't carry Joseph. Like, I'm pretty strong, but there are certain people you can and can't carry, and so it had to be teamwork of multiple people carrying one person. And it was, it was hard trying to get people up that hill. And all the while, our second years, who were there for the year just to encourage us to be there, to be mentors, they had to run laps back and forth and back and forth until we were done. And let me tell you, we were there for hours. We had second years throwing up. Like we had first years crying because we can't get up the hill. Like it was emotional, but it was this shared hardship. And after that day, I can, we were bonded. We were bonded. Another night was called fight night. And as simple as it sounds, we had punching bags around the room and we would just call out things in our life, lies that have been spoken over us, things that we've been struggling with, and we would fight it. And people around us would come around and they'd cheer you on. That was a shared hardship. We formed those bonds through shared hardship. Proverbs 17, 17 says, a friend is always loyal. Say always. Always, always loyal. Hard times reveal who your real friends are. Hard times reveal who your real friends are. Have you ever heard of a fair-weathered friend? I heard of that for the first time this week. Pastor Christian told me about it. A fair-weathered friend. That's a friend who's only going to be there when the weather is fair, when it's convenient for them, when they want to be there, when it's enjoyable to them. They're a fair-weathered friend. But for brothership to be forged through hardship, you have to be there during the hard times. That is where the real friendship, sisterhood, brotherhood is formed. But you have to be there for it in order for it to happen. If you're not there, you're going to be stuck with all these shallow relationships, not true friends. Proverbs 18, 24 goes on. So if you're following along. Proverbs 18, 14, sorry, 24. That's small writing. There are friends, and it literally does the little quotations. Can everyone do that? Friends. There are friends who destroy each other, but a real friend sticks closer than a brother. I like the ESV version says it this way. It says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. A friend of many, or of many companions. Can you say quality over quantity? I feel like that's something we hear in various situations, quality over quantity. Did you know a genuine friendship has a cost? It's not free. Genuine friendship has a cost. And we have to think about quality over quantity. You can have a lot of, like it said, friends. You have a lot of friends. When the hard times come, are those friends going to be there? Are those many companions going to be there? Or is it going to be the brother and sister beside you? If you have a lot of friends, but you don't have a brother and a sister, and I'm not talking about blood relations, I'm talking about those forged relationships of friendship. If you haven't taken the time to be with someone through those hardships, you're going to be left on your own. Real friends stick closer than a brother. That's through thick and thin, through the hard times, through the good times, through the campfires and the s'mores and the camping, and through the death of a friend. Real friends stick closer than a brother when it's fun for them, when it's not fun through thick and thin. But fake or shallow friends are unwilling to pay the price of friendship. They're simply unwilling. I've had friends before who are there for the campfires and the s'mores and the good times, but when you need them, they don't want to be there. They're unwilling to pay the price of real friendship. It's super easy to say, oh, I'm so sorry, I'm praying for you. It's much harder Say, I'm praying for you. Now, how can I help? What can I do? Can I bring your family a meal? Do you need me to do the laundry for you? You sit down. I'll take care of you. That takes some effort. That is being there in the hard times. And that's not to say that praying for someone isn't, isn't good. That is so good. Please pray for people. Tell people you're praying for them. Pray for them. That's so good. But don't stop there. 
that is just the first step. If you want to have true, real, deep friendships, relationships, brotherhood, sisterhood, you have to be there through the hard times. A wise friendship is built on loyalty. Number two, a wise friendship is built on truth. Proverbs 27, 5 through 6. I got a flip. It says, an open rebuke is better than hidden love. Wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. Can I just tell you, the truth can hurt. The truth can hurt. If I am to get dressed in the morning and look at my husband Joseph and say, does this dress look good on me? And he's like, I'm sorry it doesn't look good on you. And he's right. Like, that truth can hurt. (laughs) It's okay. I always look good. He tells me I always look good. (laughs) He, he, He confirmed it this morning. In a good way. He said I looked good. But the truth can hurt. Um, Am I in a room of friends today? Can I share some truths that hurt with you? Okay, great. Some people didn't say yes, but I'm going to do it anyways. (laughs) So, number one, God's plans are better than yours. You might be really excited about something or really want something, but you know what's not God's plans? Can I tell you God's plans are better than yours? And that can be a hard truth for some people to swallow. You can say, but Look at all these things I want to do. I know it's not what God wants for me, but it's so enjoyable. I just really want to do it. That's a hard truth. God's plans are better than yours. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. God's plans are better than yours. Ready for another one? <sighs> you Ready? Genesis 127, God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That is honestly a hard truth for a lot of people in our society to swallow. It's a hard truth. Here's another one. God has a plan and a purpose for even a baby still in the womb. Even a baby still in the womb. God said to Jeremiah, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. Before you were born, I set you apart. God knew Jeremiah before he was even in his mother's womb, before he was a thought. And he had a plan and a purpose for him. He set him apart. God has a plan and a purpose even for that baby still in the womb. There are some hard truths. But if you have true friends, you have that sisterhood, that brotherhood, a wound from a sincere friend is better than many kisses from an enemy. To have a friend come to you and tell you, I know this is what you want, but God's plans are better than yours. That might hurt, but it is far better than, oh, yeah, you go do that. That's awesome. Like, we want what God has for us. That wound from a sincere friend is so much better than the cheering and clapping and Kisses from an enemy. We need to be people who speak truth to our friends. The truth calls people higher. If I know that if I touch a hot stove, I'm going to get burnt, I'm now responsible with that truth, with that knowledge, to not touch the hot stove. Because I have been now brought higher to understand I know that I should not do that. So, I won't. I know that God's plans are better than mine. I know that now. So now I'm, I'm now responsible if I choose to not follow God's plans. The truth calls people higher. Proverbs 27.9 says, The heartfelt counsel of a friend is as sweet as perfume and incense, as sweet as perfume and incense. And it's the heartfelt advice, the heartfelt counsel of a sincere friend that brings healing and honor. 
When we look at the Old Testament, oil and wine was used for, for specific things. We can see the Good Samaritan, he used it to heal the wounds of the man that he saved. Others used it to anoint the sick for healing. And the woman of ill repute anointed Jesus' feet to worship him and bring him honor. So the heartfelt counsel of a sincere friend is to bring honor and healing. That means I don't go around rebuking people just because I feel like it and I want to wound you. The point is to bring healing and honor to that person. This verse is not a free pass to go around rebuking people just because we feel like it or just because we know better. That is not what this verse is. It is not a free pass to rebuke anyone we feel like. Nowhere in the Bible are we told to require non-believers to act like believers. We are called to share the truth, to speak life. We are not called to require them to act like non-believers or to act like believers. The truth can hurt, but it also calls people higher. When we have true friendship, when we are a true friend, we are able to call our friends higher. We are able to speak the truth into them. We are able to speak life into them because we have a sincere heart that wants what's best for them, right? A wise friendship is built on loyalty, truth, and finally, forgiveness. Proverbs 17, 9 says, love prospers when a fault is forgiving, forgiven, but dwelling on it separates close friends. Another version, the NIV says, whoever would foster love covers over an offense, but whoever repeats the matter separates close friends. Handle offenses with grace. That's a hard one. Handle offenses with grace. Can I just tell you, you will be offended by someone, by everyone. A lot of people are offended these days. You will be offended. And you will offend others. Unintentionally or not, I have offended people. You have offended people. It happens. But handle your offenses with grace. Those who demonstrate love Seek repentance and reconciliation. That is how you handle offenses with grace. You don't go at it looking for revenge or looking for the other person to fall on their knees and ask for forgiveness. When you have true friendship, you foster love, you seek repentance and reconciliation. And the responsibility is yours. It's mine. It's not the other person's, whether I was the offended or the offender, to be a good, true friend, it is my responsibility to seek love, to seek repentance and reconciliation. And the second part of this verse, it tells us don't dwell on it. You've forgiven, love is going to prosper, things are going to be good, let it go. (laughs) You did it, you forgave, let it go. And that can be hard. You can have to let go of things multiple times. Sometimes you let go of it and you're like, oh, it's still in my hand. I have to let go of it again. Oh, it's still there. I have to let go of it again. That's okay. But it says don't dwell on it. Don't repeat the matter. Blabbing about another's shortcomings, about the way that they hurt you, is damaging. Not just to you, but to them and to the people you're speaking to. It's damaging. You can see on our wall, we speak life. We speak life. That is one of our values. We speak life. We build our friends up. When we have an offense and we handle it with grace, we come out on the other side honoring one another, loving one another, having repentance and reconciliation, and that strong brotherhood, that strong sisterhood is formed through the hardships, through repentance and reconciliation. So as I was saying earlier, Joseph and I, my husband Joseph, served at the Dream Center, and we made a lot of amazing friends while we were there. One of those friends, his name's Michael, and he is like the greatest friend anyone could have. He was Joseph's roommate, and I learned so much from Michael. He 
was probably like one of the funniest people that we met at the Dream Center, but he was also the, one of the most caring, kind, loving, generous. I just love Michael with my whole, whole heart. And he became like a brother to Joseph throughout the time at the Dream Center. And we were only there for nine months. And Michael became a brother to me too. And a couple years ago, we got um, a phone call from one of our friends at the Dream Center. And he said, have you seen social media? Have you heard from Michael? I can't get a hold of him. Do you guys know what's happening? We're like, no, what, what's happening? And we, we look on social media and we see, rest in peace, Michael. We're like, this, this can't be real. This is not happening. This can't be real. And we're, we're looking up um, articles to see what's going on, what happened. Is this a joke? Like, this isn't real. Michael's, Michael's messing with us. And so we finally found an article, and mind you, Michael lives in Mississippi, so we have no way of, of getting there. We find this article, and there was a car crash. Three people, two dead. One of them listed, Michael Taylor. And can I tell you, that moment changed my life. I have not been the same since I lost my friend Michael. Michael was a good friend, a good friend. Like in the sense of the word, he was good. He was a good friend. He would call us every holiday. He would check in with us. Even though he lived miles and miles and miles away, he was a better friend than a lot of my friends here who lived minutes down the road from me. Michael was a good friend. And I hate to say that I wasn't as good of a friend to Michael as I should have been. I didn't call him and reach out when I should have. He was the one. He was the good friend. Our time is short. I didn't get to be the best friend that I could be to Michael, but that day changed my life. I said, this is never going to happen again where I will regret not being a better friend to someone. And from that day forward, I have been intentional to be a good friend, to be a friend who is loyal, who is honest, who is forgiving. And I have not been perfect. I can still be a better friend. But it changed my life, and it changed the way that I choose to be a friend to other people. Time is short. Tomorrow is not promised. You don't know if your friend is going to be there tomorrow. It is our responsibility now to be loyal, truthful, and forgiving friends now. Not later when it's convenient, not later when we have the time to check in on our friends, now. Now is the time to choose to be a good friend. So I wanna ask you again, what makes you a good friend? What makes you a good friend? Are you a good friend? Are you loyal? Are you there in the good times and the hard times? Are you truthful? Do you speak the truth over your friends even when it's uncomfortable? Even when it might hurt them? Are you forgiving? Do you handle offenses with grace? Are you a good friend? Today, if, if you feel led, that you're like, yes, I could be a better friend. I need to make that change in my life now. Let my friend Michael's life have that impact on your life too. To have this moment be the turning point where you say, no more, I'm going to be a good friend. I'm going to be a good friend. If you want Jesus's help today to help you be a better friend, would you just raise your hand and I wanna pray over you. And Jesus, I'm raising my hand too. I want your help to be a better friend. You can go ahead and put your hands down. If you would just bow your heads, close your eyes, and I just want to pray over you. Dear God, I just thank you so much that you have given us such a a wonderful piece of wisdom in your Bible, Lord, about what it means to be a good friend. Lord, I pray that you would help each and every one of us who raised our hands, Lord, to be a good friend. Help us to be loyal even when it's not fun. Help us to be there for our friends, even when it's hard, even when it's messy, even when it hurts. God, help us to speak truth. 
your truth, God, not the world's truth, not our own truth, but your truth, God. Help us to speak life into our friends, Lord, so that we can see them go down the right path towards you. And help us to be forgiving, Lord, just as you have forgiven us, help us to forgive others. Help us to handle our offenses with grace. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. I have a friend who died, and it changed my life, the way I choose to be a friend to others. And you have a friend as well, and he died for you. His name is Jesus. How is his death going to change the way you choose to be a friend? How is the death of our friend Jesus going to change the way you choose to be a friend? And Jesus is the greatest friend there is. There is no better example than Jesus. He is loyal. It says in Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He'll never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is loyal. It says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus is the truth. He's not just filled with and bringing forth the truth. He is the truth. And Jesus is forgiving. Colossians 1, 13 through 14 says, For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. No one can forgive the way that Jesus forgives. He did nothing wrong. We were the offenders. But Jesus took a step towards repentance and reconciliation, and he died on a cross for you. How is that going to change the way that you choose to be a friend? If you have not asked Jesus into your heart, if you have not asked to make Jesus your friend, and you want to do that today, you, say, you want to say, I want a friend who is always loyal, always loyal, who speaks the truth, who is the truth, and who forgives. If you want to make Jesus your friend today, you have not done that before, um, could I just have everyone stand to your feet? Everyone stand to your feet. And if you have not made that decision and you want to do that today, would you just boldly raise your hand? I'm not going to ask people to close their eyes. I just want you to boldly raise your hand. If you want Jesus to be your friend, you have not made that decision yet, amen. I just want to pray over you. And if you guys would um, follow along in prayer with me. <clears throat> to make Jesus your friend, it's very simple. You turn away from your sins, turn your life over to God, and let him lead. This is just the starting point turning away from your sins. It's the repentance, turning towards God, the reconciliation, and then letting him lead. He will always be loyal to you. He will always be truthful, and he will always be forgiving, and he will help you to do the same. So is that every head bowed, every eye closed, and we're just going to pray this prayer together. If you would just repeat after me, Jesus, thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your loyalty, for your truthfulness, and for your forgiveness. Today, I choose to make you my friend. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I turn away from my sins, and I choose to turn my life to you. Lead me in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Awesome job. Can you give a round of applause? And if that was your first time praying that prayer, congratulations. Jesus is your forever friend. He will always be loyal to you. He will always be truthful. He will always be forgiving. We love you guys so much. Have a blessed week. Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Tori. What a great message just on because I want to be a good friend too. We all want to be better friends. And I, thank you for bringing the word in that, in that vein today. Thank you so much. 
All right, well, for everyone else, if you have those Connect cards, please drop them off on your way out. And if you did accept Jesus as your Savior today, please stop by the following Jesus booth in the lobby. We have a gift for you, a free course, and a free um, book. And this is extra special this week only. Out on the plaza, our youth are selling Papa Murphy's cards. So these are awesome coupon cards. They're $10 a piece, and they have over $35 or $40 worth of value in it. There's like four, eight total coupons. Four of them are like buy one pizza, get one free. It's a great deal. Like it's way, it's way worth it. So if you buy those, it's another great way to send our youth to camp. Mm -hmm. So I encourage you, please, please donate. Please buy those cards. We got a lot of them. We got to get rid of them. Please buy them. <laughs> <laughs> please, please. <laughs> just I'm just kidding. I, if you feel, if you feel led. <laughs> All right. God bless you. We love you. See you next week. <laughs>